Postcards from a Dying World, the podcast. For more than a decade, I've reviewed over 1,000 books that are mostly science fiction, horror, and bizarro. This feed will feature bonus audio I have produced over the years, as well as a monthly digest of reviews based on what I've read each month, plus the occasional bonus material about my own fiction. Thanks for listening. Hello and welcome to Postcards from a Dying World. I have a very special guest from one of my favorite tribes of writers. That's Portland-based uh, horror and dark fiction authors uh, because I was one of them for a long time. Um, uh, Wendy Wagner is a person, I said this in my review, is an example of social media done right as an author because I just kept seeing her name and opinions and things going out there. And then when she mentioned her book, I went and requested it at my library to make sure that, and now they have the secret skin at the San Diego library because um, uh, that's, that, that's the first thing I do personally is when I see a book before I buy it necessarily, I try to get the library to buy it. <laughs> because that will end up with more eyeballs in my opinion so uh wendy wagner welcome to postcards from a dying world um very excited to have you here thanks i'm so excited to be here and i love your your library plan i think it's absolutely brilliant what a great way to support writers and libraries and and all the people who share your community too well and i'm lucky because i have a really easy way to do it because the san diego uh um, public library they just have a suggest a purchase thing on the website but i think they know my suggest a purchases because they tend to get them <laughs> so i have this theory that somebody there knows or looks when when i specifically make one because you put your library card number in and um and so they also give you a reminder when a book gets ordered and they very rarely just do, do not order what I asked for. So nice. I, yeah, and I started that plan when I lived in Multnomah County. So doing the, the Portland Library. So that's how I got a lot of books there. But anyways, um, <laughs> Wendy, your um, reading and horror origin story, have you always been a horror fiction person? Does this is this a lifetime passion? It, it really is. I can remember being like seven or eight. And uh, my sister checked out Skeleton Crew from the library. And um, she was like telling everybody in the family about how scary this short story, The Raft, was. And I had this feeling like I probably shouldn't read this book because it was obviously like for grownups. But I mean, she had said it was like the scariest thing ever. So I had to read it. And well, you know, longtime listeners are going to be are laughing because I bring up the raft in almost every episode because no that's way. yeah, the raft is my breakthrough story as well. Oh, my um, gosh, you're like the only other person I've ever met that's like, nope. no, see, that's why I'm saying on the podcast, uh, Stephen Graham Jones and I talked about the raft for quite a long time in our no episode. Um, oh, yeah. That that yeah. makes me feel so good because I, I love that story. I try to reread it every now and again just to kind of tap back into some of that youthful, like, oh my gosh, feeling. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, to me, The Raft is important because it's a story that's very simple, but it, for me as a young reader, it was seeing all the mechanics behind, like, what creates the scares because unless... Yeah, maybe the jaunt, for example, in the same book is is a scarier story, but it takes a lot of like adult know how and things about, you know, like the themes and the, the the meaning of everything to understand what what the jaunt's doing that's scary. But the raft is very simple, yeah. and you can see uh, the rungs of the ladder that are building the suspense, and that's one of the reasons why I think that story reaches people like you and I when we're young. So. So it was the raft. That's funny. We have we share the same story. But was there um, other works or longer pieces or do, it was? Oh yeah, after that. One? Well, you know, I was lucky, and we we had a a bookmobile that came to our town every two weeks. So after that point, I just like threw myself into. Um, this was like the late 80s. So it was all like Dean Kuhn, Stephen King, Charles L. Grant. Um, you know, just a lot of stuff like that. And 
I oh, of course, Anne Rice. Um, so those well, like, no, and you're given you're you're a serious horror nerd if you read Charles L. Grant, right? If you read right. that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So. I feel lucky that my library had them because like my current library doesn't really have anything by him. And it's like, oh, I'm going to have to track these down. And it's not always easy. <laughs> no, no, he's a great writer. And you know, what's really interesting, too, is that um, he wrote a few science fiction novels right. that, that were kind of lost because he didn't succeed as well in science fiction. And it's funny because I found a couple I found two of them. And I was so excited that I found these Charles L. Grant science fiction novels. And I, I really didn't have anyone to share that. That I was like, yeah, but he, he's a horror guy. And I got his science fiction. That's so cool. Yeah. And, um, but so what town was this that you grew up in where, where you were getting this bookmobile? Sure. Um, it's a town called Ash Valley, Oregon. And actually, they don't have a bookmobile anymore. The bookmobile died about... 20 years ago, and now the entire county library system has been like defunded, which is really, really heartbreaking. But mm -hmm. it's just an area on the Oregon coast. It's just really impoverished and um, really out of literally the middle of nowhere. And uh, they've been going through some tough times. Yeah, so I'm sure the bookmobile was like a lifeline to, to get but it. It really yeah. was. It was so great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, no, that that's that's cool. And and um, being that you were reading a lot of these writers during their heyday in the 80s, like a lot of times people don't understand, younger people don't understand like, um, you know, what a community and what a scene that kind of developed for, for the people who grew up reading this stuff. Because, you know, we had like Twilight Zone magazine and we had some other things, but it was, you know, before the internet, you had to happen upon these books. And then once you got a name, like, okay, now every time I see something by that person, I'm going to, I'm going to read it, right? Right. It's a, it was such a, a fun, like, it always felt like a treasure hunt. Like, you'd go to a bookstore and you'd be like, I wonder if there are any of my kind of books around, like, something that I haven't read, you know, and you'd be like, browsing, like, digging through and wondering what you'd find. And, and uh, so those were some of the authors that you grew up reading. Um, and like, for example, for me, I was a big Clive Barker, Stephen King oh, guy yeah. growing up. But, um, you know, now as, as an adult, I, I, I'm, you know, more Philip K. Dick and, and John Shirley and whatever. Who, who are the authors that just really, um, who are your favorites these days? Oh, gosh. I mean, of course, Stephen Graham Jones. I just love his stuff. Um, I really love, I mean, Joe Lansdale is mind bogglingly delightful every time I crack open anything by him. It's just always fun. Um, and this is like an old book, but I keep going back to it. I really love, uh, I think her, Anne, her name is Anne Siddons. And she has this book about, she only has like one horror novel. All of her other stuff is like slice of life in the south but she has this amazing like book from like i think it's 1978 maybe that's about like a house that is like it's a modern architecture and it sucks the life out of the people that live in it and eh, it's just like a real gem so mm. i don't know there's, there's just there's so much good horror to read right now um you know like tk kingfisher's like weird books that she's been putting out have been a real blast um yeah I don't know it just seems like there's more good stuff to read every day that I haven't even like cracked half of like the great books that came out last year by like Haley Piper and Eric LaRocca I'm just still I feel like I'm always playing catch up <laughs> right well but taking that step from uh being a reader to saying like I got to do this I want to do this I want to write my own what you know what was the inspiration for that like taking that leap well, you know, I wanted to be a writer from a very young age. I can remember reading this fantasy novel. Um, this was even before I got into horror. So I must have been seven at about the oldest. And it was like told, it was the first book I ever read that shifted from like, you know, one point of view character to a different point of view character, like from chapter to chapter. And it just hit me 
that, wow, somebody actually chose how to write this story. And finally, I realized like books weren't just things that like, I don't know, were harvested off of like a book tree or something. Um, but, you know, people made choices and built them. And that just sent me like, and that was always in my mind, like something I wanted to do, even like when I was like, I'm going to be an opera singer, or I want to be an FBI agent, I want to be a lawyer, all of those things, phases that I went through. And so after college, I had um, I had a daughter at a pretty young age, and I just really wanted like her to grow up with somebody who didn't just like jettison their dreams. And I was like, what I've always wanted to do, I want to be a writer. So I started writing like I started by writing like fantasy novels, and um, they it just like after a certain point in time, I realized like it took me so long to write a book and then like it just took so long to level up doing it and I was like I, I'm gonna try short stories even though I don't really like short stories and I picked up um this horror anthology at the library and I started reading it I was like wait a minute I forgot I love horror short stories they're like the absolute best thing ever and so then I was like 2009 or so and I just like started writing horror short stories for anthology calls because it was really inspiring right like somebody be like we want stories about the Mayan apocalypse but set in your hometown or you know whatever right. weird and theme anthologies come out you know let's do zombie erotic horror and things like that and that would just be like a little way to like give me a little spark and I would just write you know story after short story the probably very mediocre like horror stories and try to get them published in anthologies well but i see your name attached to lots of anthologies collections magazines and things so it wound so, up i got better than mediocre after a little yeah. while yeah because you know you're 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 you know your name is connected to a lot of those magazines so you you must have see i'm terrible at those submission calls i just like I look at them and go, no, I'm like, very rarely do I, I just sent one in for an anthology. It's like the first time in forever that I've done that. And I'm terrible at placing short stories. I just, I hate that process. I don't mind. I like writing short stories. I just don't like placing them. Yeah. It's not very fun. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I commend you for, for getting out there and doing that. And so you feel like, you taught yourself the process of, be of becoming a better writer because, uh, you know, I've read, you know, The Secret Skin and I feel the prose is very strong. So you must have, um, you know, felt like, you know, teaching yourself through short stories is a great way to do that, you know? Yeah, I think so. I also, you know, shortly after I started publishing uh, short fiction, I started doing like work as an editorial assistant. Um, I worked on a couple of anthologies for John Joseph Adams, and I started working with him on some different magazine projects. And I feel like just reading so many submissions really quickly kind of showed me like, here are things that don't necessarily work. And right. it, I think that really kind of helped me love, like just get stronger at creating short fiction just by reading so much of it and very, very quickly seeing what what kind of things are not going to work for me. Well, I've I've actually given the advice before because I think I took a quantum leap in my short story writing by editing an anthology and reading all kinds of terrible submissions. And 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 honestly, like reading the bad stuff, sometimes you can learn just as much from reading the good stuff. Right. And yeah. because you, you're definitely you can see the differences between the two very quickly and you start to figure out <coughs> excuse me I don't want to do this or you know um and then <coughs> excuse me sometimes it's one little thing right yeah. but um I had a story that changed everything for me when I realized that um I had somebody tell me a, an editor that I was working with on my short story collection tell me you're starting every story a page and a half early yeah <laughs> and it was like great advice <clears throat> because i was always trying to introduce the world and i didn't need to yeah right? you can just jump right in you can just jump right in 
And it's better if you blend that stuff in later. And for me, that was like a huge, like, you know, um, you're always starting a page and a half early. Uh, and once I did that, I knew to, uh, to start at the <laughs> proper point instead <laughs> of like, you know, where was I thinking before? No, I, this is where the story starts and always start at the, the, the right spot. So you, you feel like reading a lot of those submissions and those things, uh, that was a really cool opportunity. How did that come about? Just, uh, through having submitted to, uh, I know John Joseph Adams is a great editor, so he's probably, yeah, yeah really excellent yeah, person. Um, it was kind of a combination of a couple of things. One is that I had, he actually, like, for the first time, maybe, I, I think beforehand, before this book, all of his anthologies had been invitation only, and he had, like, a submissions opening for a book called The Way of the Wizard, and I think he took, like, four stories from like just like nobodies and like I think he had like 900 submissions or something like that and I had one of the so I had one of the the stories get accepted and it was nice because we actually went through he first sent me like a rewrite request like to like fix a few things which was a great learning experience like could be such a good editor um so he kind of he knew I could write um but he had a friend he had like started to get volunteers because he was just going to start the magazine Lightspeed um, at that point. And one of the volunteers who was going to help him uh, with Lightspeed was a lady I met via Twitter. Like we were really good Twitter friends and she was kind of, she had like something happen at work. So she was going to be like really busy. And so she couldn't help um, with her editorial like volunteering as much. So I said, well, you know, if you think it'd be okay, you could tell John that I could do some. And so she said, well, maybe you could try Wendy as a volunteer. And so then I started, you know, kind of like pitching in to do some of the stuff that she was too busy to do. And it just has turned into a long <laughs> working relationship. That's cool. Yeah. And so you wrote a lot of short fiction, but at some point you're you're within the horror field. Now, you said you wrote some fantasy novels and stuff. So you have experience working on a novel, but when you go to write, at least I know that you've written a novella now, but have you written a horror novel yet? Or Yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. So I've had... So my first two books that were published were actually tie-in fiction for the Pathfinder role-playing game. So I have two books for that. I have a science fiction novel that came out in 2017. And then this last summer, right before the Secret Skin novella came out, I had the horror novel The Deer Kings come out from Journal Stone. So that was a really fun book. <laughs> Oh, I have work to do. Okay, I have more more reading to do. And I, and I will because you've sold me. So, but... But after learning all these things, like what was it like bringing to bear like horror at a at a, at a, a, a longer length, like having learned these things? What do you think you most learn or most applied from those years of editing short fiction? Oh, gosh. Um, well, it is, it's kind of tricky writing um, a novel versus like a short story because with with horror, you know, you really want to be working on building that the suspense and the dread and the atmosphere and things like that. Um, and as you're writing a novel, of course, you always have to be mindful of the pace because like, you know, you the reader can kind of get exhausted if there is nothing but tension and suspense and dread and you can risk like losing them. But at the same time, you can't let that slide away or release too much or then they're like well this doesn't make sense or it's no not fun anymore and so just like sort of managing reader expectations and sort of carefully creating like little crests and waves in the book where it's like oh it's getting really scary and there's like this little bit of a reveal and it relaxes a little but not too much and just sort of um constantly managing that I think is it's a real trick of making a horror novel work. And um, I think it's part of the reason why shorter horror novels tend to um, be such a delight because, you right. know, you don't have to keep up 
as a reader, that's like, you don't have to go through so many like little lulls and things you can kind of push through and it's just like exciting stuff, exciting stuff at the end, which I mean, I love it's sort of like uh, riding a roller coaster or something. Yeah, novellas are such a great length for horror and oh, like yeah. 100 to 120 pages is just kind of, kind of perfect. Uh -huh. and, um, so um, without spoilers let's let's get into the the secret skin because um it was uh you know obviously um i was excited when the when the, when the library got it for me um and i got that notification i was like oh cool i get to check this one out now and um it it's funny because my system of reading this is a system i've developed which is that especially with library holds or books that i pick up um, because my TBR is so long, the great thing is a lot of times by the time I get around to reading a book, I don't remember why I wanted to. Uh-huh. Yep. I don't remember what it's about. I just know, okay, I wanted to read that. Um, and so a lot of times I go in not knowing anything about the plot. I, I knew nothing. And in fact, for some reason, I thought this novel was a werewolf novel. <laughs> for, for some reason and then with the title secret skin whatever oh, yeah. yeah and uh, i don't i have no idea why i thought this was a werewolf novel but the cool thing was is that i was wrong about what it was about so i was able to go in totally cold reading this which was a great experience and <clears throat> um so i always recommend this system like get a tbr long enough that you can forget why you wanted to read a book so like I, like I have faith in myself that I had a good reason for wanting to yeah. read something for to get it there. And so secret skin was one that, uh, kind of came up and I didn't remember what it was about at all, obviously. So tell, tell us where the inspiration for this was and, 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 you know, and, and the, and, and why you wanted to write this particular novel. Okay. Um, so the secret skin is um well i call it a sawmill gothic although it could be more sawmill e um but i got the idea i um it was like 2010 and i had just read stephen king's book bag of bones which is a huge part of that book is him referring back to the novel Rebecca. Um, there's nothing really like plot wise about Bag of Wet Bones that's connected to Rebecca, but it was on his mind when he wrote it and he talks about it in the author's note. And I was like, well, I should read that. You know, I like Daphne du Maurier's stuff. And so I read Rebecca and I was like, I love this book so much. Um, and I really like, there are lots of Gothic novels that I really, really like. Um, and I really, that, that one was neat to me because it was so modern feeling, you know, the way it begins, it's like so fresh with like on the seaside at like a resort, but then it just did all the things that a Gothic novel should, but in like a setting that's not you know, a musty old castle or um, out on the moors or something like that. And so I thought to myself, I wonder, how I would like to write a gothic novel, but to put it in a setting, an Oregon setting. Um, and at the same which, time- Which is also, one we really haven't seen before in a gothic, right? It's right, I feel like that, yeah. Um, especially because like, I feel like before 2000, Oregon was not like a hip and cool place. Like people were like, Oregon, isn't that place just full of crusty loggers and stuff like that? So um, I really am interested in Oregon history and I grew up on the Oregon coast. And so um, I wanted to like write about kind of the kinds of places that I had learned about historically. Um, and I tried writing this book a couple of different ways. One time at this really great writing retreat out in the woods where I actually like scared myself from like working on this book. Um, and eventually I, I like 
gave it had some different shapes and tried putting it in different towns and regions. And after a camping trip back to like visit the coast, um, I visited this place called Shore Acres, which is a place I grew up going to all the time. It's this amazing garden site on the coast that used to have this amazing mansion, um, which burned down. And I was like, oh, this giant timber baron mansion would be the perfect setting for a gothic novel. Like it would be really great. And so I did a, a bit more research about the family and they kind of inspired a few things about the book. I mean, the people in this book are pretty messed up. So it's more like their, their financial story is the story behind the, um, the, the family in the novel, not, not their personal habits. I'm sure mm. they were lovely people. Um, <laughs> right. But, yeah. Well, no, and I love the historical feeling of it. And, and, and you can, you can kind of, you can tell that there's, there's a, a, a deep interest in what's going on historically in, in, in this novel because um yeah I mean I just I think research comes through so uh, oh good <laughs> yeah. yeah so the, the book winds up being the story about um a young woman she's an art teacher in Portland in the 1920s and her brother who's like the scion of the family he's getting remarried and he's going to go on this, you know, elaborate, huge honeymoon with his second wife. And he wants somebody to stay with his very difficult child because he can't keep a nanny or a governess. So he begs his sister to go back to their house on the coast, their wonderful estate, um, which she pretty much has promised herself she would never return to, but she's a sucker for her brother. So she goes home to like, meet her niece who she hasn't seen since she like was a toddler or something and being back in the family estate like reminds her like your family was super messed up and this house is now really really creepy oh and your niece is really creepy and as if that wasn't <laughs> enough then her brother and his and the new sister-in-law like they cut short their honeymoon and show up and the sister-in-law is this, you know, force of, a very sexy force of nature. So our, our main character has to deal with a haunted house and a creepy niece and a sexy sister-in-law and things just, uh, things just get more and more exciting. Oh, and the staff, the staff is not, not kind either. Right. All right, so before we get into spoilers about this, I think you've done a really good job of the sales pitch here, but is there anything you want listeners to know about you or your career or where to find you or any of that stuff before we get into spoilers with the book? Um, I guess I could just say, you know, I have a website. It's winniewoohoo.com, which is really ridiculous or you can find me at twitter at wn wagner which is pretty normal and boring <laughs> right well um and i i think wendy's a good follow on twitter so um i you know i wouldn't be we wouldn't be here if if i wasn't following wendy on twitter so um because that's how i found the secret skin so and uh, just another general reminder that it's better to just be exist on Twitter and do your thing and be yourself than to um, o overload people. Because the thing is, is that that's why, like, I wanted to read The Secret Skin is that I just I enjoyed Wendy's Twitter presence and I wanted to see what she'd written. So and it did. And I really like this book. So we're going to get into it now. Uh, big time with spoilers so um we're gonna try to drill down on all of wendy's secrets in this book and and that way um uh writers can can learn from from her uh incredible skill because i do think this book is very 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 good it's very very well written and one of the things i'm really impressed by is wendy's ability to pack a punch with a sentence which is um, something that I thought was really, really cool. So spo that's your spoiler warning. We're going into spoilers now. I don't have a, spo a spoiler horn, but it's been blown if, if, if I did. <laughs> <clears throat> so now the secret skin. Now we can talk about it freely. You don't have to worry. Like, you can spoil. And the first thing that I want to point out is 
you know, one of my favorite sentences of the book, which is, you must really be my aunt if the house wants to kill you. <laughs> so <laughs> let's talk about the house. Um, oh, I love that house, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Did you map out the house? Did you base it on a real house? What, um, what did you do? I did a draw like a little floor plan because I kept like getting lost trying to picture it. Um, the house itself isn't really inspired by any house that I've been to. It's sort of a conglomeration of like things I've seen in movies. I feel like that front staircase with the portrait on the landing, I feel like that's in some movie that I've seen and I don't know what it is, um, but I wish I could picture it. <laughs> Probably a lot, actually. I feel like, yeah, it's like the, the signature of like a great house is opening the door and there's like an enormous like staircase going somewhere. Well, no, um, I, I quote this all the time, but one of my favorite <coughs> quotes about writing um, genre of fiction uh, Rudy Rutger the cyberpunk author oh. <clears throat> Rudy has this great saying where he says that you know writing genre of fiction is a lot like playing power chords and there are certain notes and things that you have to master like you know uh, the Ramones or ACDC have very simple songs but you know they have to master these things and writing a genre a, 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 a gothic there are certain power chords you have to hit there are certain things you have to do and to make people feel comfortable that they know this. So what are some of the things that you 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 did to make this recognizable as a gothic? Um, it's pretty great because since I wrote this, this novella, I've been talking to lots of different people about like, what makes gothic fiction gothic fiction, right? And it's a different people have a lot of different ideas about it. But I think, you know, some of the things that really kind of, jump out at you is like being really gothic fictiony like is like the big house that seems really glorious on the out like when you first look at it and then when you look up close there's like little things about it that suggest it's been neglected or like it could fall down at any point in time and so there are a few little things that I wanted to make sure to plant in this story like when you first see the house it looks really great but then like at one point like she's looking at like the doors to like the garden like their French patio doors and like she can see like the the paint is flaking and they haven't been tended to um and so I think little things like that are really nice um another thing that I think pops up a lot in gothic fiction is sort of this distinction between like this pri the face you show the world and then like the private face and um so like there's definitely like an upstairs downstairs kind of quality to this book where like they go into like the areas that are just for like the staff which is also where they stash like the the, the little niece and they're like not pretty and they're just like really shabby and plain and um but then you know just other things like you want to have I mean it gothic novel every gothic novel should have like a great bad weather moment I think <laughs> lightning right. or thunderstorms or something fun like that um, well it's interesting for me too because I'm not a huge fan of gothic fiction and so what's funny is is that <clears throat> like when I said I don't remember why you know I, I think it was just that I wanted to read your work and I didn't really I don't think I looked at what it was actually about part of the reason <laughs> why I thought it was a werewolf thing yeah <clears throat> but um and it's not that I haven't read gothics and don't like them I I have um I liked Mexican gothic by Sylvia Marino Garcia last year <laughs> as well and um so i can like a gothic it's just it's not my typical genre so i can kind of recognize some of the tropes but i know them more from film right yeah than i know them from from reading and and so that was that was a really cool aspect of it too so and and i don't know why i'm coughing so bad right now by the way and i just gotta comment to that for the listeners so i'm sorry i'm gonna try to cut out most of it but for some reason, I just, my throat just like tensed up. So anyways, so now let, let's get into, the, let's go back to that line. You must really be my aunt if the house wants to kill you. When I say 
that you do a lot with the sense. I spent a lot of time unpacking the sense in my review. And <clears throat> what I thought was cool is because here, like you, you get world building about the house, right? You get world building about the family and you get a suggestion of, you know, um, June's fear of like this new situation, like seeing and, and, and being around this, this niece. So there, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, am I reading too much into this one sentence? Because I, I found this very powerful. Um, no, I, I don't think so. Um, I mean, like at this point, you're starting to see that pretty much everybody who lives at this house winds up dying some sort of awkward or miserable way. I'll, we never really talk about how the mom dies, but I mean, her dad is murdered and her sister-in-law is also probably committed suicide or it's kind of left unclear a little how she died. Um, but you know, everybody dies here. So there's like definitely this familial bond that if you live here, you're going to die. Um, and then also, I definitely wanted to plant the feeling that the house didn't like Abigail and to sort of have them be two characters kind of at odds with each other. Um, and that's part of the reason why later, Abigail, the niece, and when she starts spending time with the main character, why they spend a lot of time outside the house. I think Abigail doesn't really want to be there. So I have a question for just you and me and everyone else in the world who's read the book okay and you can choose not to answer this question but do you understand or did you did you want to know what the spirit of this house was why this house had this malevolent spirit like um is there a name for it is it just a mood a vibe like how deep did you go um in thinking this through before writing it uh, it kind of evolved more than anything. My original approach to the story was more about really focused on like, I knew I wanted the house to be a haunted house because that was just like the number one goal because I love writing, I love haunted house novels. But the more I wrote, the more I felt like it wasn't just your regular haunting. I think I was inspired quite a lot by uh, the haunting of Hill House that way, in which it's not just one spirit that is like having an influence on a place, but also, you know, some houses are just born bad, you know, that that line. I think if I remember what movie trailer that's from. Um, but then as I was writing, I sort of stumbled into this idea that June and the house were born on the same day, right? And this idea that one's kind of the good seed and one's kind of the bad seed. And um, and that just really kind of drove a lot of, of the work through the second half of the story and kind of reframed my approach to writing about the house. There's another quote, a sentence, uh, that was when the house first started whispering to me and I knew I had to leave Stormbreak as quickly as I could. So that relationship that um, June and the house kind of developed over time, positive, negative, I mean, like, you know, the relationships we have with our friends aren't always positive. It's not always black and white. You know, we have ups and downs. Um, so I got this impression that you know, that, that there was a developing relationship between the house and June, that it wasn't always like kind of a straight arrow. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so you must, I mean, you did a really good job with the world building of this story as far as <clears throat> presenting that the idea that, that, um, and just with that line, that's when the house first started whispering to me. So did you think a lot about, you know, what the house is trying to tell June over those years, like, you know, is it trying to warn her that things are happening or to, to consistently scare her? What's, what exactly, you know, were you thinking with that one? Well, I, I kind of think the house is 
um, you know, there's, there's like a, a theory of haunting that house that places can be like psychic batteries, right? And they want to take energy from the people that live there or, or like the energy from the people that live there, like charge them up. And so I really had sort of imagined that maybe before she left Stormbreak, like she, like the house was more like just watchful and observant, sort of like June herself was, but then like all the death and trauma that happened that made her leave the house, like changed the house a lot. And I kind of feel like when the, the feeling that I had about writing it was if you have, so I have a calico cat, right? And calico cats are often like judgy and proud kind of cats. And when we go someplace, a lot of times the one cat will run up when we get home and be like, you're home. And the calico cat will sit in the middle of the room with her back <laughs> right. turned to me and she won't look at me for like, three or four hours and then she'll start like walking near me and giving me these looks and the looks are somewhat hard to interpret. I, they could be, I'm happy to see you or they could be, I wish you would jump off a ledge. Um, and, and so that's sort of, I feel quite a bit at the beginning, like when she first gets back to the house, she's sort of like dealing with this calico cat <laughs> that's um, irritated with her for leaving but glad she's back but also like being like fed a large dose of like energy from her arrival and it's sort of like getting uh getting it's like voice for the first time from just like kind of coming awake and alive again and so I'm not sure like if you're like I, I think it takes her a long time to even discern what the message that there are messages and that I don't know if they are they're not in words so it's kind of hard to figure out what they mean I think they're more like I'm going to get you <laughs> right now okay so I'm going to shift gears a little bit on that because I do think you did a great job answering that question about the house as far as the – it's funny because a lot of the blurbs on the book, and I don't usually look at them until I'm done reading it, <laughs> honestly, because, I again, I've sold myself at some point on it. So maybe I read the blurbs a long time ago. But a lot of the blurbs focus on the love story or the lust story and and, and, and the sexy aspects of the book. But, but for me, like, I kind of thought that that was – that was not what I focused on when I, when I read this book. I focused on the mood and the tone and the and the vibe and uh, of of the house and all the scary stuff and then so for me like those aspects they felt like to me they felt like a chapter or chapter or two or something and it was funny to me to see that there was so much focus on that on on the blurs because. Well, it was there, and, and, and I liked it. I liked those aspects of the story because it was interesting, and it added flavor to it. it I don't know. Did it seem to you like people like seem to focus yeah, that, on that a little bit more? Because, like, when I was writing this book, I, too, was like mostly just like focused on, this is a story about a girl in a scary house. And it was, I mean, I, I, did, I wanted, so, like, in Gothic fiction there's like a lot big tradition of like you know women tend to be sort of like like p women who have desires are often punished right like Bertha Mason Mrs. Rochester's wife she's like this hot passionate lady and what happens to her she gets locked up in the attic like and for things that probably today you wouldn't call her crazy but um, of course after being locked in an attic she definitely had some mental health issues and I think there's you know there's just like this real there's like this long long history of of characters in gothic novels or even just like the idea like the whole gothic romance like sub sub genre is really about like women's desires and things so I wanted that to be part of the book and I also wanted it like 
I wanted there to be like a happy ending and I wanted there to be like a way for there to for like a nice family to be made at the end of the story. So I did wind up like in, like including like this kind of romance aspect, but that was not in my head like the important thing. That was just like a way to sort of A, make the house angry because like those, you know, behaviors were not really looked on very well in 1920s Oregon for sure. Um, well, but it, and it it did present one of the one of the neatest narrative tricks you did in the book, and um, <clears throat> which I mentioned in my review. But once the the love story is kind of consummated, right, the narrative shifts where you had a little bit of second person where you know June is is writing to somebody, but you don't really know to who until that moment. And to me, that was an excellent transition. That was a really neat like twist uh, of the narrative and um i was i was really impressed by that i i thought that was that was great it was an oh, a plus thank you. yay a plus moment <laughs> so yeah so at any rate like when i finished this story i was like super happy about it and then like my editor he was like why isn't the scene sexier why isn't there more here or more fire here it's like well i don't know it wasn't that important to me like so to me it was really sort of like when people are like talking about the love story and stuff is like well I'm glad it worked for you but for me that was not a number one priority well right and 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 that for me as a reader it wasn't either but but I did think that that transition and then like when you realize who she's talking to because it's subtle throughout the book there's just little transitions of you did this or you just little use and so like I, I paid attention to it and I was like oh, okay this is I don't think I'm the you here <laughs> that this is talking to. So she's going to be writing it to somebody, but I kind of blended into the background and I kind of forgot about it. And what's interesting too is because I'm not a huge fan of first person as a narrative device. I'm a third person all the way. I tried writing a story a couple weeks ago in first person and I made it three paragraphs in and I was just like, nope, can't do it. Um, and one of the reasons why, but the thing is, is as much as I don't personally like first person, if it's done well enough, I forget about it. I lose track of it. And then I go, okay, the book's working. If somebody's bad at it, then, and they're cheating constantly, the first person, or or they're doing things that no one would ever do, or talking about things in a way no one would ever do, then, then that's what I can't stand about first person. And that's one of the reasons why, for example, Dolores Claiborne is one of the best first person novels because Stephen King never cheats on yeah. first person. He never yeah never ever cheats but what was really cool here is, is that you were doing lots of tricky things because you were slipping in in the tense narratives and every once in a while i was writing to somebody and so that transition was great because it's like 50 pages in 50 59 pages in and then i go oh now i know who she's writing to okay that makes sense and that changes the whole narrative um it becomes something else and so that's that's a really good twist and 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 a plus to you on that Yay. So, yeah, um, i wanted to do it like a, a letter because i wanted to do that i voice because i it's a great way to sort of um you know re withhold a lot of information right it really limits yeah. the point of view but also i wanted to be able to write prose that was a little more prosy right like and so it, I feel like well, she's an when, English teacher, right? So when you're writing to somebody, you could yeah. maybe write things in a little more like pretty fashion than you would if it was just like a narrative dump out of your brain. <laughs> right. Well, and you established she was an English teacher and that she might write flowery stuff. So that, that, that works. But again, like I said, I, I lost track of that. And, um, so one of the last uh, things that I just really wanted to bring up is I, I I loved love 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 well I got two two more things but the when um, June tells the house to hush <laughs> it, and 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 it immediately it um, as if it had been listening to me it fell silent and I thought that was that was a super creepy moment because I could really picture her like putting her you know, like looking around and just telling the house to be quiet. And then I just really pictured the house just, that, that was just with one sentence, 
I think you you did a lot of Yay. of making it work for me. <laughs> so I felt like you know, in like a horror movie, a lot of times there will be like this moment where it's all chaos and action, and then if something happens and it goes quiet, it's like so scary, right? Like I love that in like the sound design when they do that in a movie. Um, like that contrast between loud and quiet. And so I was like, oh, I wonder if I can pull that off, like, but in writing. So I'm glad well, it worked and, for you. And for a, for a haunted house, for the, even if the haunted house is actually taking your direction, that's freaky. Yeah, you know? that's true. If you're like, stop it. And then the house stops, you know, that that's, that's, you don't expect the house or the spirit to when you yell stop it you know i don't know it's kind of like you know us shushing our, our senior dog who barks all the time she can't even hear us but we still we still shush her sometimes like Shh, you know <laughs> and we can't help it and i think so i thought about that a lot with the house is like you know um you know that the house is is yeah, the house listening was was, was a creepy moment. <clears throat> now I, I've I've since returned your book to the library, so hopefully it's in somebody else's hands. Fingers so I, I cannot read from the ending, but I remember very distinctly that right up until the last couple paragraphs, I thought the book ended very strongly. And um, was was this how tight was this book from first draft to final did you write more did did you have this ending cooked in from the beginning are you a pantser or did you outline like i know it's an interesting time to ask that the ending but <laughs> that's um, where it felt like it was really well planned to me is how it came together at the end oh yay um actually this is one of so I've, I've gone back and forth on outlining, no outlining, how much planning I do, the way I revise. Um, you know, like my first two books, because they were written for a company, I had to do long rounds of extensive outlines with them and stick to them. And so it was definitely one of those situations where I wrote, you know, like, 16,000 word outlines and then I wrote the book and then they give me their feedback and you edit to spec. Um, and then other books I've done like some outlining and then some like panting and really like with my two horror pieces so far, they really wound up being the sort of thing where I had like a vague outline where I knew certain things that I wanted to happen I wanted and I had a vague sense of the ending and I would like write and then I'd stop and then outline some sections and then if I needed to change things I'd go back and sort of edit what I'd written before and then write and stop outline and it's sort of like a, a re-rolling rewinding and re-polishing and pushing through kind of process as opposed to like writing a whole draft, going back and revising a whole draft. Um, and that that really worked for me for these two projects. Um, but the ending, I really wasn't exactly sure. I wanted them to escape the house in this like, ex in like this big explosion of energy and have a lot of exciting stuff happen. But I wasn't exactly sure what was going to happen, except I knew they're going to get attacked by her mother's painting. And so I'd sort of written up to that point, and I was going to a friend's house for dinner, and I was on the train, and I was like writing. I found myself writing the last letter that's in the book about what happens. And I got off the train and I had to walk to her house. And I, I just sort of stepped under the awning of a, a restaurant because I was had such a good idea for those last few paragraphs that I had to write them. So I just like that's stood awesome. there outside in the rain and finished writing them on and I like ran out of paper and I had to like write some on the back of a receipt. And 
uh, it was pretty exciting to just have like one of those moments where your mind is just like, That's no, awesome. wait, you are not doing anything until you get through this. So I carry a notebook in my backpack for that very reason. So. Right. I do too. Yeah. yeah. And I, I need to check that I still have paper more often though. <laughs> Well, that that's great, uh, and it was a, a powerful ending, and and it worked really well for me. What what am I missing about the secret skin that you, on a spoilery level, that, you know, what what haven't you been able to talk about in public that, <laughs> with this book that? It's kind of funny. Really... I don't know. Maybe the book spells it out enough that nobody seems interested in it. But for me. The skin aspect was a really fun thing to have in this book and the idea of like presenting this fake front to the world because I think that's a big part of what the story is about right like yeah. she lives in a family that's very focused on looking just so they're very highbrow society people and her mother is like so afraid that they'll look bad that she you know abuses her children for having like dry skin essentially <laughs> and right. the the idea of the house as being a kind of fake skin for the family um and so like for me i loved those aspects and it's nothing anybody ever wants to talk about <laughs> well that's interesting so let's unpack it a little bit because oh you know, i had that too um uh punk rock ghost story is very much about the difference between punk rock before the internet and after the internet. And oh, wow. I bring that up all the time when I talk about the book, but like very few people are like, Oh, let, let's drill into that. Well, yeah. you know, like what's that difference is. And even though it has like massive quotes at the beginning that like spell out like the, the theme, but whatever. So you got here with this book, like it's in the title it's it's a thing and i admit i didn't write about it like in my because because i focused on the vibe and the tone because that's um my favorite thing about the book is the vote is the vibe and the tone right yeah and and um but you know this that is a a, a really good um kind of reversal on the whole gothic thing is that the idea that you know that because so much of what makes gothic fiction gothic fiction is the imagery and the way everything views and if like the whole thing is just a facade you know to to hide like you know we're just a bunch of you know backwoods oregon coast people like you but we we hide it you know yeah. like, in this uh, uh, on the shell of this big house i get it i get it i see it you know it's there and um and and I do think that, that that's really powerful. So was that a huge part of the inspiration from the beginning, that theme? Or Actually, did that develop on its own? It kind of developed on its own. It also, like, so there for a little while, I was in a, in a group and we would, like, read horror novellas and long short stories. And I mentioned the fact that um, my family has this skin disorder. And my friend Nathan Carson, who's a fellow horror writer he, who's in this group with me, he's like, Wendy, that stuff is creepy. You've got to include it in your novella. And I thought, well, that's perfect because it's like, you know, this book is all about family and the way they can like not work and they can pass along such terrible things. And what's a better way to talk about that than by having like, a congenital disorder that's shared in a family. So I set to work on that. And then I realized like, I was also like developing all these themes about like appearances and how appearances are fake. I mean, all the way to like, you know, like the, the sexy sister-in-law Lillian, she really, you know, she, when, when she's freed from her role of being like, mrs rich guy she just wants to dress like a guy and just like be not a beautiful woman she just wants to be like a normal herself like like she doesn't but she has to put on these fake exterior of beautiful gowns and things like that um so i just think like there's just a lot that there were just lots and lots of things that like had worked themselves into the book and then like they connected really well with this whole like images and and skins and things like that 
I think even the word skin is kind of gross to say. Uh huh. Yeah, there's a lot of yeah. Skin can be can be icky and ooky, and it and it works. So, um, Wendy, this was awesome. I really love breaking down your novella. It was awesome. I have more of your work to read, and when I do, I'm sure I'll hit you up for um, some more awesome and creative discussions. I think um this is really good thing for writers to 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 learn from i I, that's one of the things i i want is like to increase the circle of like you know what i like i the reason i write reviews of books is because i i if i write a review about it or if i do an interview with an author i'm going to get more out of the book because i'm going to learn from them too right yeah and then if I just read it, yeah, I might have fun, but I'm not going to learn as much. I can yeah. write about it and digest it I and work that. through it. So, and now you've entered the fine tradition of writers that have come on and talked about the raft, um, yeah. Yeah. In, including uh, Laird Barron, Brian Keene, Stephen Graham Jones, myself, and 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 now Wendy Wagner talking about the raft. Um, so I'm sure my listeners are like, okay, enough already with the raft. <laughs> Um, but but you sh- they have all read it now and they should know. So they should know. it's excellent. It's fun. Yeah. Any uh, last things you want to uh, tell the listeners? Now here they they there are people that have read the books. So oh, I can't think of anything. I feel like we had some really just great discussion. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 cool to break down a book like this. Um, and um, what's coming next for you? Um, I. Yeah, just, I don't really have anything in the pipeline right now. I'm working on a book, but it's not, who knows what will happen to it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, yeah, it kind of slowed me down. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, we'll keep track of what you're doing and, and um, you know, and, and obviously uh, um, in many regards to, to all my uh, um, Portland writing, writing homies. Um, it's really cool. Uh, every time I can, I can, add somebody to my Portland author's shelf. It's always fun. So on Goodreads, but, uh, Wendy, thank you for your time and we'll talk soon. And, um, uh, offline, I got a, I got a recommendation for you of, Ooh, that I just read. So yeah, well, I guess I might as well tell everybody here. Yeah. Just teased it. But, um, I just read, um, ice by Anna Cavana. Have you read this? Oh no. This is is a really cool novel. This is like one of the best end of the world sci-fi horror novels that I've read in a long time. But I I thought of you when I was reading because the prose is just really fantastic. And when you were talking about a book, it's really hard to extend that feeling over a whole whole novel. Yeah. This this, this one and does it really, really, really well. And she was a really interesting character. She was a heroin addict and a in and out of mental institutions in the forties and fifties and, and apparently wrote the first parts of this end of the world novel about ice overtaking the planet, um, uh, on, uh, handwritten inside, um, one of the institutions she was in. And wow, what a story. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. So I just finished writing my review on it, but it's like, it's one of the neatest, um, it's the coolest, science fiction book I've read from the past since like Canical for Leibowitz where it wow. super holds up and, Coolest. and yeah, it. timeless, timeless. So, um, and so a little Easter egg for the people who made it this far is I can we recommend this one to you too. So, uh, but thank you, uh, Wendy. Um, um, I had a really great time with this book. It was really, really cool. And, um, I will be in touch in the future. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. It was so good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. And we'll talk again, I'm sure. Awesome. All right. Bye, people.